am early. Hey guys, I'm only five minutes late today. And honestly, I was ready. We were just kind of being relaxed. Welcome to Wednesday. It's real simple cooking school time. I'm your host and teacher, Dawn. There's a lot of action behind Phil and Tessa. Hello, gang. Um, today, we're going to talk about steak. Um, before we get to that, let's quickly review the rules. We wash our hands. I did that. Two, we play nice. Please stay chill in the chat if you don't have anything nice to say. So long. This is a constructive teaching kitchen, and we aim to keep it that way. So again, if you don't have anything nice to say, go bark up someone else's page. Um, guys, you're really cooking at home. For those of you who haven't joined the face group, gr Facebook group yet, do it. Um, see what your compatriots are cooking. You guys are doing awesome stuff out there. I love seeing it. We had some really successful one-pot pastas um, out there in the world. Phil made it. Rebecca made it. Heather made it. Um, super easy. So today we're going to talk about steak. Now, when we were conceiving this episode, we know you guys have lots of questions about steak. Um, which types to buy? I'll try and cover that and shout out the questions. Brooke's working the comments, and I'll try and answer as many as I can. But I wanted to talk about hanger steak. One, because I think it's an oft overlooked cut, um, and I really like it. So just before we get going, look how adorable the graphics are on this butcher paper. This is just from our like kind of fancy market downstairs, but oh, so cute, the district. Who's your graphic design person? Anyway, looking at the meat counter down there, the hanger steak was, for the record, the cheapest one in the case. It's not really cheap down there, anything, but this was far less expensive um, than some of the other cuts, your New York strips, your ribeyes, um, even your flank steak was more expensive than this. Um, why do I like hanger steak? Well, it's very tender. Um, it's got great flavor, flavor similar than you would get from like a New York, from a ribeye, something with more marbling. That means fat, that's what gives it flavor. Um, hanger steak is often referred to as a butcher's steak, and that's because the butchers used to keep it for themselves. There's one per animal, um, and it comes from the diaphragm. So the diaphragm, you've got hanger steak, and the skirt steak also comes from that area. So it's not a part of the cow. This does come from an animal. Um, it's not a part of the cow that gets a lot of work. You think about like the shoulder, um, that's a muscle that gets a ton of work. That's why you typically cook that long and slow to break down the tissue so it gets really tender. Um, you don't have to do that with hanger steak. It's great on the grill. We're just gonna steer it in a pan real quick today. Um, but it's my vote. If you guys haven't tried hanger steak, you should give it a try. Vegetarians, I'm sorry, it's mostly steak today, but there is some other content um, that I'm gonna offer you a little bit later that you can use no matter what. Okay. So hanger steak, here's the deal. It's kind of this big thing. This is a better view. <clears throat> it comes in like two sections and it has this pretty, I'm gonna say gnarly, piece of connective tissue that runs down the middle. Um, now, as the, the amount of fat that you trim off is totally up to you. Um, fat often adds flavor, but sometimes you get those like big, like chewy parts and my husband loves them, I don't really. So up to you how much you want to trim. This is looking pretty clean, so I'm not going to take um, too much of the fat off, but I do want to show you how to remove this piece of connective tissue. Do you see it? It's like impossible to miss. Um, so I'm going to leave the paper here just because uh, to keep my board pretty clean. Sharp knife is key here. Um, I would say something not, not too big, but something that you can kind of handle with confidence and it's not going to get away from you. Um, I'm going to start this way. So the bigger side, there's usually one bigger side to a hanger steak and the smaller side. Um, we'll talk about how to, how to apply them in a second. This kind of goes for all like butchery tasks. You want to work in long strokes. You can always come back, but you don't want to like go in there and saw at the thing. It busts up the meat in a way that's like not pretty on the other end. So you can just like make small slices. And if you're like me and you know, 
I don't do this super often, but you, fought, you let the connective tissue guide you. We can always come back and trim it later. Slice and use your fingers to pull it apart and make sure we're in the right direction. Slice, pull it apart. Slice, 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 good. Okay, and this knife, thank you David, is very sharp, so it happened pretty easily. Now, but you can see, I still have a decent amount of this and a decent amount here. This is not fat, okay? It's connective tissue, which means it's gonna be really chewy, so we wanna get rid of it. And this, you know, it does take some practice, but <clears throat> one way to do it, can you guys see this okay? Sharp knife again, you wanna wiggle the tip underneath, and like the middle is fine. And then, remember when we took the skin off the fish? Kind of similar. You just wanna back and forth. And keep an eye on it. Don't just like go hacking away. You wanna stay as close to that connective tissue as possible so you don't lose so much meat, okay? So, and it's always easier to go away from you when you're making these sorts of cuts. So I've got my knife underneath. I'm holding on to it. And I'm just sliding the knife underneath the connective tissue. Bonus butchery lesson, you guys. And sort of like lots of cooking tasks, you can always take more off, but like you can't stick it back on once it's off. So <clears throat> err on the side of taking less away, and you should be good. Any questions so far? Is everyone freaking out? Yes, people are freaking out. OK. <laughs> OK, good. Great question. Chris wants to know, is it true that we should let steak come to room temperature before cooking? I'm gonna say generally, yes, especially when you're dealing with like a thicker piece of meat like this. The reason is if you put a cold piece of meat in a hot pan, the outside's gonna cook, you're gonna get a nice sear on it, but it's gonna take too long for the inside to cook, for the heat to get in and warm up the cold steak. So you'll have like a very rare inside, which Perhaps that's what you're looking for. Um, but bringing it to room temperature, and all that means is like 30 minutes, which is you know about the time we're gonna chit chat and deal with this. Um, 30 minutes will help you have better luck cooking it to the temperature that you like. More questions? I'm just gonna keep trimming a little bit of the fat. Um, see where that saying comes from? But this is looking pretty good. And see how I've got like the skinny part? Now, what you could do, <clears throat> We're gonna cook it all today, but you could cut this up, stew it, um, or use it for kebabs. Actually pretty nice uh, kebab situation. Um, but you can see we're gonna deal with it a little bit when we get to the cooking. You're gonna have pieces that are gonna cook at different rates, right? Because they're different thicknesses and that kind of thing. Okay, I'm gonna come back with my big guy and we just wanna continue to take that connective tissue off. This is pretty good. I think you guys should be able to see. You can also, by the way, and maybe most importantly, ask the guy at the meat counter to do this for you. Um, if you're buying your meat in, like already wrapped up in the little tray, you'll often, this will already be done for you. Um, but learning to do it, I don't know, I, I like to do it. It's kind of fun. Um, reminds you what you're eating for better or worse. Um, but don't for, you know, don't be afraid to make friends with the folks at the grocery store. They are doing that job because they're really good at it and they know how to do it. So if you're freaked out, same goes for like breaking down a chicken. You wanna buy the whole chicken, um, they'll break it down for you. So same thing, just a little bit more of that connective tissue. Looking pretty good though. There's also a little bit of this silver skin. You can see it's sort of, can you, can you guys see this? It looks like a weird extra layer. Um, like even like, you know that part of the onion that's like between the layers? It kind of looks like that. But that's gonna be um, tough to chew as well. So we just wanna get rid of that. But they did actually a very nice job cleaning this up downstairs. Okay, so here's the thing. One of the other reasons I chose the hanger stick is because it's very, very clear which way the grain runs. We're always telling you at the other side of cooking once it's cooked and rested to slice against the grain. Super easy to see in a steak like this. You see this? So we're gonna slice it like this. Just makes it easier to chew. It's not the end of the world if you don't do it or if you get it wrong. Any questions so far? Yes. yes. Oh. 
Yes, Gail, maybe you're just joining us. Hanger steak, often called a butcher's steak, um, because the butchers used to keep them for themselves. Um, so they could be sold under the name butcher steak. Also, sometimes like on restaurant menus, you'll see it looks like anglet or anglais. That's the French name for it. Um, but it's a really versatile, really yummy and inexpensive cut of meat. Okay, any more questions? Chris wants to know how long you should let the steak rest after it's cooked before you cut it. Great question. How long do we want to let the steak rest before we slice it? Five, 10 minutes really depends on how big the steak is. Let's take a trip back to Thanksgiving. Same thing, telling you to rest the turkey before you carve it. Even if you let that thing rest for 30 minutes, it is so hot. I have to wear gloves when I carve it. Um, point being, a big thing is gonna retain more heat for longer. A small thing is gonna cool off faster. It's just like common sense stuff. So I'd say like this guy, five minutes. This guy can handle five to 10. So up to you. Um, what I am gonna do, I'm just gonna cut these so they are a little easier to handle right in half. This guy is pretty big and I'm actually, he's got kind of this natural seam. So I'm actually gonna come back and make another small steak. And that's the only advice I would give when you're like dealing with meat yourselves is just like look for the natural seams. Especially if you're like breaking down a pork shoulder um, for a stew or something, it'll show you where it wants to get cut. So that's three, I'd say like that's four ounces, five ounces, Five ounces, I'm just guessing, it doesn't matter. We'll do that guy in half. Okay, cool, ready? Yes? Yeah. Yes, okay, great. Sometimes I look to the folks in the room to guide me and it's like, they're like, guys, we're doing work. Okay, should we sear the steak? Yeah, and when it rests, we'll do the other stuff, okay. Now, you could use a cast iron pan. I'm gonna use the stainless steel pan today because I actually want you to see what's happening in the bottom of the skillet and it's a little bit easier to see on the metal. So, heavy bottom skillet, why? You just got more control. It's gonna get hot and stay hot. But the trick with searing steak or pork chops, as the case may be, you wanna get your pan hot and then turn down the heat a little bit. Um, otherwise, you're gonna burn the outside. Um, so I'm gonna let that get hot and I'm gonna use vegetable oil because we're going to sear it on pretty high heat. Olive oil will, um, you know, it has a, a lower smoke point. So it'll start to smoke um, before vegetable oil will start to smoke and we'll have a little more control. You could use clarified butter. That's another lesson. So seasoning pretty aggressively. Remember guys, seasoning well and often is going to be the difference in like fine food and like really good food that you're making yourself. Season pretty aggressively on all sides. The other thing about hanger steak that just makes it a little bit tricky, it doesn't have two sides. So once it gets in the skillet, you know, this one kind of has three, this one has three, this one has like, I don't know, five or something. So we'll often say in recipes like cook turning occasionally until deeply brown on all sides. What we're telling you is like, if there's a side, like you let it hit the pan because that's just gonna build more flavor. So I'm just gonna turn it, season all the sides. I'm using kosher salt. You guys know that diamond kosher is my preferred. Now, if you wanna use sea salt, totally fine. Um, the reason I like kosher salt and the reason I like, I, I think that kosher salt is a good salt to start using when you're cooking more and more is you can really feel it and the grains are consistent. Um, so you'll get the hang of this much in my fingers is appropriate or, or not. Um, some of the less refined salts, your coarse sea salts and whatnot, are like a little harder to control. Totally fine to use, um, but I think it takes a little more finesse and a little more confidence, which I know you have. Okay, freshly ground pepper, always. My pan's getting nice and hot behind me. Here's like, I don't know, something that seems obvious. I've got a, like extra salt and pepper on my tray. Just like give your friends, and by that I mean these pieces of steak, just a roll around so you don't waste any of that. Cool? Cool. Okay, any questions so far? Yeah, uh, Diana wants to know if the hanger steak is the same as 
No, great question. A hanger steak is not the same as a skirt steak. Skirt steak, you'll see another great cut. They are getting more expensive because I think they're getting more popular. Um, skirt steak is about that wide. Um, also a very visible grain, but they're thin. They're generally, I don't know, like an inch tops, and that would be like a big one. Um, skirt steak, great for tacos. It, they can be, skirt steaks can be hard to um, like cook to your preferred doneness, I think because you have to get your pan so ripping hot that's kind of hard to do on a home stove um, so that you don't end up cooking it all the way through. But skirt steak, super delicious on the grill. It takes to marinades really well. Um, that's why it's like great for tacos, stir fries, that kind of thing. Okay, a little bit of vegetable oil. My pan is hot, nice. So I'm gonna add this, add my steaks, and I'm gonna turn the heat down to medium, okay? And this is, I'm gonna come back and do that guy later. This is one of those instances where I really don't wanna overcrowd my skillet. Overcrowding is gonna create steam, which we don't want. We want like a super nice crispy sear. So essentially dry, it's like a dry heat kind of thing. Okay, I'm gonna turn this down a little. Remember, I'm the boss. If I wanna turn this back up, I can turn it back up. If I need to turn it further down, I can turn it down. But don't feel like you're, you're married to the heat that you select, okay? Um, and remember, all stoves are created different, so you'll have to get to know yours and romance it accordingly. Okay, now, this is one of those situations, no touching. It hits the skillet, and I'm doing other stuff. However, this isn't gonna take that long, so we're not gonna do other stuff, we're just gonna stay here. But that's what makes steak such a great weeknight option. This is gonna take maybe 10 minutes of active time. You've got some other stuff going on. Oh, did you happen to put some tater tots in the oven? Yes, winning dinner. You're cooking a beautiful steak. Have a nice, delicious side of tots. You make a salad, you're done. A thing, a thing, and a salad. Right, Sam? Right. Okay, so we're just gonna pay attention to this. But see no touching? I didn't put it in and move it around. Letting it sit in the pan is what helps create that super delicious crust, okay? And I can see it. Look, there's like some golden brownness happening on this edge. So I'm thinking like, huh, some things are starting to happen. I'm gonna peek, but I'm not gonna overdo it. Looking good, but we're not there yet. I'll show you. Looking good, not there yet, okay? Questions, comments, concerns? Good question. Um, Jane wants to know why I'm using stainless steel instead of a cast iron. Honestly, you can use either. I just want you to see what's happening in the skillet when I take the steaks out. You'll see why in a second. Um, it's just a little bit easier to see on a stainless, uh, on a stainless pan. But you can absolutely use a cast iron. Remember, I love it. Gets hot, stays hot. Treat it right, you'll have it forever. Um, I, I'll cut to the chase. We're gonna make a little sauce in there. Um, using the fond, F-O-N-D, I think is how it's spelled, but all that means is like the bits that get stuck to the skillet and they're easier to see in the stainless, in the stainless one. Okay, what else? No other questions, but Chris says she's happy to finally get the hang of hanger stick. <laughs> yes, girl after my own heart. Um, she's happy to get the hang of the hanger stick, love it. Um, did I mention we're doing steak two ways? That's what we're doing. Gonna make a simple pan sauce and then we're also gonna make like a really yummy, creamy dressing for a salad preparation. Um, but we're gonna do all of that while this steak rests. Pretty fast. Side of tots. I'm winning, right? Okay, I think we're probably gonna be ready to turn here. And I'm, see, it's getting kind of quiet in the skillet. We haven't talked about it in a while, but five senses cooking. I'm using my nose, I'm using my ears. Um, we're gonna taste it. I'm gonna touch it. 
but it's getting a little quiet in the skillet. So I think I want to turn this up just a tad. But looking pretty good. See this like beautiful brown crust here? Looking very, very nice. And like these pieces are kind of square, so we'll need to come back to the sides, but that's it. If you're nervous, you can set a timer, but you really don't need to. You're cooking to golden brown or, or deeply browned on, on the sides. That's what you're looking for. My guess is that took three or four minutes if we check the timestamp on the video. Um, while that's doing that, I am gonna make a little bit of dressing. But I don't want to pressure you to do that at home. Just watch the steak. There will come a day when you can do this at the same time. Okay, creamy dressing, you ready? This is the base of your blue cheese, your ranch, and my personal favorite, for steak, a horseradishy thing. I like equal parts mayonnaise. We're gonna use that much because that's what was left in this jar. Uh, okay, equal parts mayonnaise, sour cream, and buttermilk. A Little bit of extra acid, in this case we're gonna use lemon juice, and then whatever flavorings you want. Could be the blue cheese, could be feta, could be goat cheese, could be horseradish, could be herbs and a little shallot, if you wanna go the ranch direction. You see? It's not all formulas, but it is kind of all like base recipes. And eyeballing it, that looks good. No measuring, no recipe. Although I will give you a recipe if you guys are desperate. But if you do, Brooke, maybe you can write this down. Quarter cup buttermilk, quarter cup sour cream, quarter cup mayo, half a lemon, shallot, salt and pepper, then you can do whatever you want. Uh, this, that much feels good. And you can always add a little more buttermilk if you like to thin it out a little bit to reach the desired consistency. That's like other recipe language that we use a lot. Like I can tell this is gonna be a little bit thick. But I'm gonna add some lemon juice too. Time to check on the steak. See, I don't have to complete the task. Just going over here, gonna turn it, looking good. <coughs> We're gonna get all the sides, remember. Uh, that side needs to go. This side needs to go. Okay, finishing your dressing. Let's do half lemon. I'm gonna wash this knife real quick because I know some of you will freak out. We will one day cover proper um, knife handling per David's suggestion earlier today. Okay, I'm gonna put in half a lemon. There happened, oh, I was gonna say there are no seeds, but there were. No big deal, I'm just gonna go back in there with my spoon and fish them out. I just got so hungry, my stomach growled, I heard it. A Little bit of salt, a little bit of pepper. And this is your creamy dressing base, if you ask me. If you didn't have a lemon, you could use a little white wine vinegar. Um, I think that's like a nice neutral one to use. And you want it to be pourable, right? But still thick, that looks pretty good. And then let's add a little bit of horseradish. This is prepared horseradish. You can totally use fresh if you can find it. You grate it on a microplane. Um, but you'll generally have to use twice as much fresh horseradish as prepared. Now, I'm gonna, I gotta get in here a little bit. There we go. Really living on the edge, walking. We'll wipe it up later. One more of those. Good. And stir that in. Now, look at this. It's looking kind of thin now because there was some of this liquid from the horseradish. I might want to add a little more sour cream. Let's taste it first. Mm. It's so good. It's going to be so good with the steak. Actually like it. I'm gonna keep it. Flavor's really good. So I don't wanna fuss with it too much. Just a little more salt. And a little more pepper. Remember, if your pepper grinder is not working, give it a shake. It often means there's just like a little peppercorn stuck there in the gears. As much pepper as you like, but definitely salt. 
uh, whiskey whisk. There you go. Let's try this again. I'm doing everything right. Mmm. Mmm. So good. So good. Okay, back to the steak. Things are looking awesome. We're getting close. That doesn't really have much of a, of a uh, fourth side, so I'm going to put him upright. I might have to hold it. Maybe not. And then this guy has one more side. So can you see, I've created kind of a wall here, but if you guys can see all these like bits and pieces, that's good, that's the fun. That's what we're gonna use to make our sauce. Maybe, <clears throat> could someone grab me two platters slash plate type things, please? Um, but this is looking really beautiful. Now, oh, and you know what else? is the instant meat thermometer. I think it might be here. Da -da -da -da. Okay, we've talked about instant meat thermometers before. This is a thermopen. I love it. This is not sponsored content. I just like this th thermometer. Um, if you're nervous about cooking your steak, use a thermometer. For medium rare, I suggest cooking to about 125. It's gonna keep cooking, remember, like all proteins when you take it off the heat, probably by about five degrees. Jerry, you know I don't like rectangles. Thank you. Personal preference, rectangles are fine. Um, cooking to 125 here, it'll carry over cook to about 130. That's about, that's medium rare. If you want it more cooked, keep cooking. I don't care, it's up to you. This guy is kind of the most thick, so he'll be a good, a good barometer. And I don't do anything fancy to like get to the middle, but I do sometimes use my fingers. I got like, okay, that's gonna be the middle. 110, so we're not quite there. So we'll keep things going. But my guess is these smaller guys are gonna be closer to ready. No, also 110. Okay, going back in. But that's it. Same thing goes for the grill. Now, for my pan sauce, I don't need very much. I have a little bit of chicken stock. That's there, it's by the stove, because that's what I'm, where I'm gonna use it. A little bit of vinegar, and a little bit of butter. Again, you don't have to do the sauce. I just want you guys to see how this works. And just like a couple tablespoonfuls Cold butter will melt evenly and thicken your sauce without breaking. If it breaks, don't worry about it. It's still gonna taste good. I'm just gonna put it right there. We'll stick the butter in the fridge. And I'll grab my greens. Whatever you like, steak salad. I like something crunchy because the beef's gonna be like really tender and soft and yummy. I'm gonna go ahead and pull this because you know what, we don't have all day. Ooh, this is looking really good. And you know what would be better is if I just pulled the plate toward me. It looks pretty awesome though. Now, come over, see this. We'll cook this guy later. <laughs> you can see these bits in the bottom of the skillet. We're gonna add some stock. It's gonna be hot in there. Don't worry about it. This is deglazing. It's picking up all that stuff from the bottom of the pan. Tons of flavor in there. Now, if you needed to, if it was like a little bit stuck, you come back with a wooden spoon, even a whisk, and you just give it like a little bit of help. You could use, I mean, I had chicken stock, so we used that, but if you had like beef broth laying around, that's a good one. You could use water, but like doesn't give you a ton of flavor. But didn't I just make a little sauce with water? I feel like I did. Does anyone remember what it was? I don't know. Anyway, we're gonna bring this to a simmer and we're just gonna cook it down. Um, I'm gonna add a little bit of vinegar just to balance it out. Cause right now it's just like meaty and salty and that's good, but a little bit of acid is gonna help balance that out. Da -da -da -da. Um, you could use red wine vinegar. I would say lemon juice, not so much. 
that's sort of a personal preference. I don't love cooked lemon juice um, in savory preparations. You like it? Go for it. Any questions? How you can make a steak tender. Um, I need like a little more information. My guess is, the question was how do you make a steak tender? My guess is the steak is, is getting overcooked. Um, that's my guess. So, but if you like a well done steak, that's kind of the, the trade off. Um, I would say, Choosing the right cut will help. Sirloin, which I know is very popular. Sirloin steak is very easy to overcook, and it doesn't have a ton of flavor. Um, I also find it kind of livery. Again, totally my preference. If you like sirloin, do it. Cook it. Do your thing. Um, but I do think maybe trying a different cut could help. Um, give the hanger steak a try. Give the skirt steak a try. Those are both like less expensive options. Um, yeah, sirloin and flank steak, they're good. They're not my favorites. I had a little bit of sour cream on this uh, whisk. It's OK. Not going not gonna to burn the house down. But I will give it a rinse. And I will put this on very low. I don't want to add the butter until I'm like ready to go on that one. OK, so what I have here, some romaine. Crispy, crunchy, let's give it a quick wash, because you know about the romaine thing. It's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. Give it a quick wash. I also have some radicchio. That's this pretty purple guy. It's bitter, but it's so pretty. Um, so I love to use it. Adds like some visual interest to dishes. Sometimes I like to just pull apart the leaves. You can have it. Makes it like a little bit easier. So pretty though, right? So this is, I mean, we're making a three ingredient salad and then we made the dressing. Could you use your go-to vinaigrette? Absolutely. Remember, just I'm giving you guys ideas and then I want you to exercise your free will. Um, which, according to Facebook, you're totally doing. So I am so happy to see that. Beautiful radicchio, ready to go. This piece is extra purple. Okay, washing it regular way, filled our spinner up with cold water, letting any bits and pieces fall to the bottom, <coughs> watering plants with the wa extra water, and then we give it a spin. Questions? Resting. Pardon me, Brooke, what was the question? Which steaks have the least fats? Um, Tenderloin, which is like a filet mignon, um, have very little fat. Remember, fat equals flavor, and in my opinion, fat's not bad for you. Um, body needs it for function. Um, but yeah, flank steak's really lean. Um, tenderloin's really lean. Sirloin is very lean. That's why like when you see um, ground beef, like ground sirloin, that's the one that's 90% um, meat and 10% fat. That's what they mean when they say like 10%, it means 10% fat. Helpful? I hope so. Guys, I need one more big bowl, I think. Or no, I just need a bigger platter than this. Something oval. Okay, see how I'm resting? Steak's resting, steak's resting, amazing. I'm gonna use this butter in one second. Okay, I'm gonna turn this back up. Jerry, that's great. Trade you. Actually, no, I'll use this, I'll use this for the one. Okay, remember how we have surprise tots? I know. So, oh my gosh, they got a little bit dark, but that's okay. I'll eat the dark ones. Tots ready. Our sauce is about to get finished. I'm just gonna bring it back up to a simmer and then we're gonna whisk in our butter. See how these guys are resting? If I had it together, I would have maybe covered them with foil. Don't worry about it. A little bit of butter at a time. So remember, right now, this is just like chicken stock, whatever. If you make a really robust and rich chicken stock with like wings and backs and parts that have a ton of uh, collagen, you'll get like a much richer sauce. But don't worry about it. The butter will help thicken things. 
Remember, pan sauce optional. You could also make our creamy dressing or just use a vinaigrette or lemon juice, olive oil, whatever. Guys, your kitchen, your rules. I'm gonna lead you to water, okay? You do the rest. Any questions? Sure, wants to, um, someone wants to know about butter breaking. It's a kind of thing, all it means is, um, we actually haven't talked a ton about emulsifying, but you know when we make the vinaigrette in the jar and I do shake it, shake it, shake it? We're doing that to emulsify the fat and the vinegar, right? That's what we're doing here. We just wanna emulsify the fat into the liquid. Um, now, Traditionally, and this is why you use cold butter, you want that to happen slowly. If you've ever tried to make mayonnaise at home, um, you add the oil drop by drop by drop. Same thing goes here because you want that fat to become incorporated very slowly. If you go too fast, it will break, which just means the fat will stay separate from the rest of the stuff. Does that make sense? It doesn't taste bad, like on the palate. It may like feel a little bit weird, but like, it's a thing like let the restaurant worry about that. You'll get it, but it's not like, it's not bad for you. Um, it just may be not like date night worthy. You know, it's like kind of like a fussy thing. So the bottom line, don't worry about it. Is that okay? Um, but. Like so many things, you'll know it when you see it. Um, and we'll see if this one breaks. If it does, that's okay. Crunchy romaine. I've got some very pretty radicchio. Guys, food styling one-on-one. -on -one. When you're plating salad, it's almost like the leaves were falling from the sky. You cut them. You cut them and you let them fall on the plate. You cut them as they were falling and laid on the plate. Keep a light touch. I could like fuss with this for like a long time. I'm not going to, but that is plating salad 101. I hope you're interested. And if not, it's okay. Just get to the steak. But my sauce is looking pretty good. I want to taste it. Now, I haven't seasoned this because I've only seasoned, but I only seasoned the steak. There's a decent amount of salt in here but I might need, it might need more. What's the other thing that's gonna improve your cooking more than anything else? Tasting as you go, that's right. It's actually very good. Actually, you know what it needs is like a little more acid. And hopefully that won't make my sauce break or get weird, but I think it'll be okay. And it's starting to thicken, which is the other thing I'm looking for just so it doesn't run all over the plate. Nothing special, okay? I'm gonna put that, on. it's on real, real low. I'm just gonna turn it off. That's gonna stay hot for a minute while I slice the steak. You ready? Any questions? We're like headed home right now. Chris says, if you can see how much the middle of the steak gives, you can tell whether the steak's done. <clears throat> In a word, yes, but it's a little more complicated than that. One thing that, oh, you know what I forgot to do? See how I've got a little bit of um, steak juices coming out? I want to add that to my sauce. That's flavor. Yum. Okay. That was just like a, a waste not moment. Okay. Back to testing for doneness. Professional cooks and like grill cooks, the people who are cooking steaks all night long, can touch a steak and know like, it's a perfect medium rare, it's a perfect medium well, be good to go. Here's the thing, you make a fist and see, feel this part of your hand. It's very, very firm. That's a well done steak. You open up your hand, give it a little bit of shake to relax. This, same place, that's like a rare steak. See how soft, very firm, soft, very firm. So 
yes, you can test it that way. I'm not even comfortable doing that, like kind of, but if I want to be sure, if I'm entertaining, serving it to people who I want to impress, thermometer, okay? Okay, here we go. Now, you can still see the grain. You see how easy it is to see on the steak? V easy. And I want to slice it against the grain. Now, that doesn't mean I have to cut it crosswise. You could. Um, but you just want to be like somewhere against it. So I'm going to do, uh, you know, on an angle. Guys, I did a pretty good job. Now, this is a little rare. It's OK. I think this group will eat it. And I think what it probably means is these smaller pieces are like really nicely cooked. I'm going to put it here. Let's look at one of the smaller ones. And this I am going to cut straight across. Yeah, this one's nice. Still like a little rare in the center. That's maybe partially my fault. Um, could have been at room temp a little bit longer, but no big deal. Again, all you have to do is cook it longer. Um, I used to have a friend who was conditioning for a race. He wanted to hit a certain time, and he didn't do it. And he went back and forth and thought like, oh, I should have done more hills. I should have done more strength training. I should have done more sprints. And the end of the story was he just didn't run fast enough. Sometimes it's that simple. So all I have to do is cook a little bit longer, right? Um, tots, let's do it. Could you mash these up here? Let me put that one over there. Um, another good way, if you're nervous, if like you get a perfect sear on your steak and you're like, I don't want to cook it any longer, get your oven hot and you can finish it in there. Five minutes, you should be good to go. And this one we're going to finish with our pan sauce. Also, food styling 101, fan it out. Let them see how perfectly you cooked it or imperfectly, if that's your thing. Um, and then you get to have tots. Oh, you know what would be really good? You make your pan sauce, you make your creamy dressing, serve on side for dipping of the tots. I don't know, that sounds pretty good to me. Brilliant. In fact, let's do it. Mmm, so good. Okay. A little bit of my sauce over top of this one. Ooh, nice. Put this in the gravy boat whenever you want. Maybe finish it with a little fresh chopped herb. Or our favorite, a little flaky salt. Remember, I season the outside, but not the inside. So that's going to be real nice. Questions before we go? I'm just going to drizzle this, and then we're going to eat lunch. Two questions. Two questions. They better be really good. That's a great question. How do you, if you cut into your steak and it's not to the doneness that you like, what do you do? This is when I would just like have the oven on when I'm cooking steak. You can throw it in there. But like keep an eye on it. You cut, make that first slice and you're like, ugh, it's not going to be good. Stop. It's much harder to fix once you slice the whole thing because then you're dealing with like a stir fry situation, which is like opposite of, of where we want to be. No, next question. Ooh, that's a good question. Okay, you've got people who, people coming over, they like different dunnesses of steak. How do you feed them all at the same time? The dunnes of steak that they like. I would say don't. Sorry, but I'm kind of serious. Like, that's a hefty order. I would maybe not do individual steaks um, for a group, just like from an entertaining perspective. It's a lot of work on the cook, a lot of work on the host. Um, but that said, you saw here, we've got different dunnesses right here. This is actually like my preferred cook. I'd say it's like closer to medium, the medium rare. That's a medium rare steak. 
Back eye is more medium because he's smaller. So you could just cut your steaks accordingly. You guys see that hanging your steak is actually a very good option for that. You're going to have two. If you start everything at the same time, you'll have two steaks that are more well done and likely two that are less done. But I would say don't do steak. Don't do individual steaks when people are coming over. That's my advice. Rebecca has a question from inside the house. Oh my gosh, of course. At 2 p.m., you guys, we have a very hilarious and special program called Road to the Royal Wedding premiering today. Premiering today at 2 p.m. It is, like, in all honesty, super hysterical, and I don't think it's just because I know Sarah and Liz, the stars of the program. As you know, Royal Baby arrived this week. We're very excited for Wills and Kate. Guys, congratulations from me to you. Um, but we're really excited about... Prince Harry and Meghan's upcoming nuptials. So watch Liz and Sarah as they get ready for the wedding. Are they going to go? Are they not going to go? Um, and that's about it. Guys, join the Facebook group if you haven't already. Make some steak this week. Or if you're a vegetarian, make a creamy dressing. Or just cook anything. Clean out your freezer. Clean out your fridge. Make scrambled eggs. Show me what you make. Cook for yourselves. Cook for your family. I'll see you here next week. Have a great one. Bye.